Very good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, ORF uh, for this uh, special event. Uh, you know, it's been about uh, 10 days of Trump, so we are all in Trump's world today, and we, we feel it for the last 10 days. Um, but today we are going to discuss uh, 10 years of um, India's Act East policy. And just to give a very quick uh, background of uh, what we are talking about, uh, this year, 2024, is uh, marks 10 years of India's Act East policy, A AEP, uh, which was unveiled by the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the 9th East Asia Summit in 2014. And this itself was a diplomatic um, upgrade of uh, what used to be called the Look East policy of India. And uh, what this uh, step up highlighted uh, in many ways was the importance of Southeast Asia and by extension, of course, of East Asia uh, in India's uh, geostrategic framework. Now, after the announcement of the AEP, uh, the, we significantly bolstered India's diplomatic, economic, and defense ties with uh, countries of the region. Uh, in 2018, all 10 ASEAN heads of state were in India for the Republic Day Parade, which showcased uh, uh, for India the importance of this region. And India has also been emphasizing ASEAN's centrality uh, as the hallmark of its um, uh, Act East policy, uh, and subsequently in shaping the vision of the Indo-Pacific and also, of course, in strengthening uh, the comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN and with the East Asian countries. So what the AEP has done is open several new areas of cooperation and collaboration, including um, maritime security, trade, connectivity, and of course, also uh, cultural diplomacy. So for our panel, which will unpack all of these uh, issues today, we have uh, four broad framing questions, uh, which is what we'll put to each of our panelists. And uh, these are, one, what are the key takeaways of uh, 10 years of India's uh, Act East policy? Two, uh, has India's Act East policy harmonized with uh, its Indo-Pacific vision? Three, uh, what are the challenges and roadblocks for India's AEP? And four, what are the new areas of cooperation as India moves forward with its Act East policy? So we have a stellar panel of experts to, uh, to unpack each of these issues. And uh, I'll just give a very quick uh, introduction to each one of them and then call them um, one by one. Uh, we have to my right here in person, um, Professor Rahul Mishra, who's an associate professor at the Center for Indo-Pacific Studies at the School of International Studies at JNU. He's an expert on politics and security in Southeast Asia. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, Don McLean Gill, a Philippines-based geopolitical analyst and a lecturer at the Department of International Studies de La Salle, um, University Manila. We also have uh, Pratnashri Basu, uh, assist, Associate Fellow uh, of the Indo-Pacific at uh, ORF uh, in Kolkata uh, with the Strategic Studies Program and the Center for New Economic Diplomacy. And then we have Yanitha Menon, uh, an analyst at Institute of Strategic and International Studies, uh, which is a think tank based in Malaysia. And her research focuses on uh, Indian foreign policy, geopolitics of South Asia, and Malaysia. So, very rich experience, uh, uh, an excellent panel. And let's start right away uh, with you, Professor Mishra. Let me give you the floor uh, to address those four uh, framing questions. Thank you, Ambassador Basaria, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm delighted to be here in this uh, discussion this afternoon, and I thank ORF. Uh, particularly Abhishek for putting this together. Very timely uh, conversation. Being a South Asianist, I've been feeling that there's not been discussion enough discussion on Actees, even though this is uh, the year uh, marking 10 years of India's Actees policy. 
Uh, what I propose to do, sir, with your kind permission, is uh, I'll focus on the key takeaways uh, in this first 10 minutes that you've kindly allotted to me. And then perhaps other questions can be answered at a later stage, because I'm sure other colleagues, uh, other panelists also should, uh, must be having their own thoughts. Uh, now, if you go through the literature uh, available in media and in the academic community, ladies and gentlemen, you will see that uh, there is a sizable number of, uh, uh, of scholarship which uh, says that, which is critical of India's Act East policy and says that uh, Act East policy is basically nothing but a, a, a game of semantics. It's, it's just a wordplay. It's, Lookist uh, repackaged, and you find this kind of literature in the region, in the Southeast Asian, Indo-Pacific region, uh, but more prominently in the West. And by West, I mean the UK and, and the US. Um, there, there are also scholars uh, based in India who say that uh, what has happened uh, over a period of time, that is a launch of Lookist policy in 1992 and Act East 2014 onwards, there's not been much change. So I thought I'll start with trying to bust that myth. And we have tried to do that in our book also, uh, titled India's Eastward Engagement with Professor S.D. Muni and myself. Um, so my first point there is that the change, or if you uh, take away, if you will, is that compared to the Look East policy or India's engagement with Southeast Asia during the Cold War years, the uh, geographic scope uh, in terms of engaging number of countries in terms of going to other regions, uh, Indo-Pacific, the wider Indo-Pacific region, the Asia-Pacific, uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia, Southwest Pacific, you have a whole range of new countries on board as part of India's Act East policy. The difference is Look East policy 1992 to 2014 focused on Southeast Asia, particularly the ASEAN region, ASEAN and its member states. What has changed is uh, these new countries in the Pacific, Japan, Korea, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and also the US as a resident superpower in this region, which is very much there in, in our Act East engagement, even though you can't, you can't really say that US is part of Act East engagement. Uh, but still, Southeast Asia and ASEAN remain at the center. So there is continuity, good amount of continuity, but also good amount of change, impressive amount of good change is how I would uh, uh, put it. The second development or takeaway of Act East policy is India's participation in security-centric institutions. And by that I mean, um, I mean the big, biggest example is Quad. Compare this with what happened in between the years 1992 to 2014. No security-related, security-centric architecture, of course it was not uh, it, it was not there in most of the cases, but we did not even uh, look around to find something like that. Uh, go back to Cold War years, in all these 60 plus years, India's policy has been to avoid, to strictly say no to any security-centric institutional mechanism, uh, thanks to our non-aligned policy. Now, these security-centric institutions have also evolved because of a qualitative change in our relationship with the US, Japan, and Australia. And by the way, Japan and Australia are the last two countries which went on board India's Look East uh, engagement. Japan was uh, actually the last one to say, yes, we are okay with your, your Look East policy seems promising and we are okay with it. And 2014 on, uh, Abe Shinzo and Prime Minister Modi's personal equation uh, also contributed to that. Um, Quad and uh, Quad in its previous avatar in 2007, but uh, more prominently 2017 onwards, we see how US has tried to bring India on board and make it a part of a security-centric uh, institutional um, mechanism or mechanisms. Uh, and I'll talk about other mechanisms later. The third major takeaway or achievement is uh, our policy shift is India's newfound focus on policy initiatives rather than institutions or uh, institution building, if I were to use a term from academic community. Institutional, institution building was something that India tried to, uh, tried to work on and focus on for all these years. And the difference is, uh, today you have Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, you have SAGAR, Security and Growth for All, you have uh, uh, these two as major initiatives, but if you want to include Project Mossam is also one of the initiatives. 
Compare this with institutional, inst institutional initiatives or institution building efforts, uh, BIMSTEC and Mekong Ganga cooperations in comparison. So there is a clear shift from institution building to policy initiatives. And these initiatives are also very, uh, very vague in nature, in the sense that you have launched an in initiative, but you are asking countries to join it. It is very fluid. It is very uh, open to all all friendly countries in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, but also demands membership. So Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, for example, India has been pushing for <coughs> membership of this uh, initiative. The only exception there is FIPIC, the Forum for uh, India and Pacific Island Countries. That is one institution that we have built and we are working on it. Uh, others all are institutional or policy initiatives. The fourth is India's uh, transition uh, from being a country that used to support its friends in defense, repairs, and refurbishing, like in case of Vietnam, or mediating back in 1993. So would bail me out on that, when India uh, actually acted as a mediator between Russia and Malaysia when they were looking for aircrafts. And uh, in an in Indonesian case also, India has played that role of a mediator or using its good offices to crack a deal, help its friends get something. In case of Vietnam, all their Navy uh, refurbishing and uh, uh, post-sale repairs, India was the country which helped them. And all of this uh, was mostly uh, without any charges or minimal charges. So that was the case in between 1992 and 2014. What has happened from 2014 on is India is emerging as a defense exporting country. So you have countries like Philippines and Vietnam, which are interested in Brahmos. They've either signed an agreement or have already have some supplies, initial supplies. Or you have countries like uh, Indonesia, which is uh, interested in, uh, in the Akash missile. You have Malaysia and Myanmar, which have uh, bought some uh, uh, equipments, but are still at the, at, the, uh, at the lower stages in terms of uh, technology used uh, or weaponry uh, uh, in terms of its uh, stages, whether advanced or very primitive or uh, uh, or in terms of scale. So to put it in lay person's term, India used to be, was, was seen as a, as a friend who would repair things for you. Uh, to now India, which, uh, to which you can go and get your defense supplies. So from a repair guy to a supplier guy is the difference in, in the defense domain is how I would put it. Uh, also, a very interesting development which is emerging is India's interest in ports, building ports. Sabang, uh, Indonesia is a, is a very good example. There are reports uh, saying that India is interested in Vietnam also. Uh, I would say this is a, a kind of a, a um, reinvigorated interest in Vietnam uh, in terms of uh, uh, helping them build a port or upgrade a port or having your military, benign military presence in these areas. Uh, so port uh, upgradation and helping your partners and friends in uh, upgrading uh, their port facilities is, uh, beyond the neighborhood is a new development. Earlier, we've done that in, the, in India's immediate neighborhood, that is in South Asia, in, in Colombo, for example. But now this is going to the Southeast Asian region, and I'm sure in times to come, it will go to the South Pacific. So ports, again, is a very interesting development. Uh, the sixth is focus on trilateral and minilateral uh, strategic initiatives that have a very, a, a very focused sector, sectoral approach. So you have TDIO, for example, Trilateral Dialogue on Indian Ocean, or QUAD, or Colombo Security Conclave, which is for the Indian Ocean. You have JED, Japan, Australia, and India, the initiative. At least the initiative is there. I mean, not much is happening there. But uh, uh, again, you have France, uh, India, France, and Australia, the trilateral initiative for the Indian Ocean region. You have SCRI, the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative. So all these minilateral, trilateral initiatives are basically working as patches to fill the gaps that you have in Actis policy and wider Indo-Pacific engagement. So these are the six major takeaways on the good side, like changes happening and good changes happening. But not everything uh, that has happened with, uh, with Lukis is good. There are some components which are um, basically continuity. 
business as usual, and in some cases, that's not uh, a very good development. And the first one is the case of Myanmar. During the 1990s, India was seen as a country which, is, which, which was largely defined as democracy promoter. India's very strong response to the coup back in 1990s uh, was actually one of the examples used by the West as to how to respond to a military coup in a so-called third world country or a developing country. And of course, we paid the price, but we stood as a normative power uh, in the region. And later on, of course, we meant uh, our ties with Myanmar, but that policy remained the same. Compare that with 2021 Myanmar coup. Now we are seen as a country which is uh, subdued, very calculative in its approach, very mindful, I think it would be a better word, because we are also uh, keeping a close watch on what our, other, uh, what our, our neighbors and other major stakeholders are doing. For example, uh, how is China responding to this situation, or Thailand, or other ASEAN countries? So the change that has happened is India as a democratic power or a norm diffuser uh, has, has transformed, mutated into a country which is more ASEANist, ASEAN-like approach. And there, uh, the key point is that we are all, we've also been saying that we are not going to interfere in uh, domestic matters of a particular country. And uh, we look at, Dr. Jashankar has been saying that we are only focusing on our self-interest. That too is, of course, uh, on a case-to-case -case basis because when we go to Southeast Asia, South China Sea, we talk about norms and in the rest of the world also. also. Uh, so this shift uh, for India, whether it should be seen as, as a, a negative development or just a more pragmatic approach is something that we have to see. Um, Another uh, myth in India's uh, engagement with Southeast Asia, look East and act East policy, and I think there are hundreds, if not thousands, of works uh, starting with this idea that India's look East policy started because we were opening up economic reforms, uh, liberalization, privatization, globalization, and we just wanted to catch up with the, with the world, open our economy and benefit uh, from the region. That, to my mind, is a myth. Because if that was the idea, if economic reform and engagement was the idea, why did we end up signing our FTA in 2009? That is roughly, what, 17 years after we launched our Lupis policy. And even um, if, you, if you connect the dots, India's withdrawal from RCEP is again a sign that economic engagement has never been our idea. It was actually the Milan and Malabar exercises and strategic component which drove India towards the uh, Southeast Asian region, because we realize that there is this superpower, uh, a power vacuum and superpower uh, uh, element of global system, that is a bipolar world, was no longer in place, and therefore you needed to create your own mechanism, maybe talk to your peer group, smaller and middle powers uh, in the region, and create a mechanism that would stabilize, bring status quo to the, to the international system. So I think on the economic side, uh, this is a myth. India's a... Uh, Withdrawal from RCEP was when we withdrew, we said rules of origin, uh, uncontrolled dumping of Chinese goods, and also um, uh, uh, the idea that uh, we, are, uh, we are not able to, uh, to basically have fair trade practices in dealing with China. But has India been able to stop any of these uh, elements? I mean, the Chinese, China-India trade has only gone up. Chinese dumping of products in India has only gone up. And rules of origin point is actually uh, very much in place because RCEP countries are uh, still trading with India, right? So, and this is a point that uh, Niti Aayog CEO, BBR Subramaniam also raised, that maybe we should consider, uh, and he went, actually went a step ahead and said RCEP and CPTPP. I'm not very hopeful about CPTPP, which is very ambitious. But India's approach so far has been very uh, too calm not just on RCEP, but also on Indo-Pacific economic framework. I mean, we've been uh, uh, hesitant uh, to an extent, timid in, uh, in even embracing the, the uh, policy components of Indo-Pacific economic framework. So that is a, a, a challenge for us. Um, Dismal performance on infrastructure, and uh, you have examples of IMT, uh, India-Myanmar 
Thailand Trilateral Highway. You have Sitwe and Kaladan. Nothing has happened there. Uh, one may argue that, uh, you know, most of this is happening because Myanmar is, is not a stable country. But Myanmar was a stable country between 2015 and 2020. And it was a pretty stable, friendly country uh, between 2001 and 2015. And yet things did not move. Of course, you cannot put the blame solely on India, but look at China. Uh, the Kyakfu um, port, for example, in Myanmar is an example, how they built it and how they managed to do it. So um, uh, that is a, another, uh, I mean, takeaway for us in the sense that we have not made much progress. The good side of this is that in the northeast and region, northeastern states of India, there's been a lot of progress made. And that is where I think the, the ray of hope is. Um, my last two points are, one, the initiatives that have been taken are not followed up. Uh, so there is still a, a lot of scope uh, to, to make the best, to get the best out of this uh, situation, to fully optimize India's activities, policy, and engagement. And also, I think we need to have a, a, a relook at our priorities. Maybe there is a need to readjust our priorities uh, in, when we engage with ASEAN as a regional grouping, but, uh, also other institutions, but also member countries of the Southeast Asian region. And how do we uh, put this in sync with uh, the Indo-Pacific engagement is something that we have to perhaps discuss maybe at a later stage. So, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much uh, for that overview. You know, uh, perhaps after this, other speakers have spoken, I'd like to push you on a couple of ideas. Uh, for instance, do you see these absence of a security-centric uh, kind of push as a weakness of that policy. So, you know, you made a balance sheet of six positives and perhaps four negatives, but where does that figure in it uh, is perhaps something we can, uh, we can talk about once we've heard all the speakers. So let me move uh, right away to uh, uh, Don McLean-Gill in, in Manila uh, to get your perspective uh, in about 10 minutes of, uh, of uh, the framing questions and whatever you may have heard from uh, Professor Mishra. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ambassador Visaria. It's a true pleasure to have this opportunity uh, to engage with ORF um, and, of course, with distinguished colleagues in this conversation. Now, while we had you know, a good perspective from India, as Professor Mishra has outlined uh, the positives and the negatives, uh, I think that for us to determine equally the significance and effectiveness of a policy such as the Act East, uh, we need to get in perspectives from Southeast Asia as well. And being a Southeast Asian, a Filipino of Indian origin, who has been um, quite detailed in looking into the evolution of security dynamics between Southeast Asia and India, uh, I'm quite honored uh, to be able to provide my observations along with the Philippine general perspective uh, towards uh, the Act East policy and India's role in the region in general throughout the years. Now, uh, the India since 2014 has illustrated more initiative, confidence and determination in terms of its foreign policy and defense establishment. While decades ago, there was some sort of an issue in translating the growth in India's material capabilities to a proactive foreign policy, or at least a, a, an external outlook beyond uh, its immediate neighborhood. Uh, but we are seeing that change and we continue to see that change, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. So among the foreign policy cornerstones of the Modi government is the Act East, which has significantly indicated India's willingness to effectively position itself in the highly dynamic geopolitical landscape of the Western Pacific, uh, second, I believe, is there's a, a clearer recognition and acceptance of its fate as a rising great power. Uh, and third, of course, is a more active and consistent role as a, uh, as a credible security and economic partner, particularly beyond the IOR, and to act as a provider of options to developing states, particularly in Southeast Asia. 
And I think that one of the successes of Indian foreign policy in Southeast Asia is a recognition that Southeast Asian countries do not want to choose particular options. They want to have a wide array of possibilities to work with amidst the uh, exacerbating and equally uncertain uh, geopolitical dynamics in the region. Many in the West often dismiss this as being fence-sitters, but given the nature of our geopolitical neighborhood, it becomes a practical and oftentimes uh, a limited option for Southeast Asian countries to maneuver freely in the region. But still, India going its way to provide options is something that I think has been quite beneficial uh, for many in Southeast Asia, including the Philippines. So, you know, there was a much needed timely position which New Delhi had eventually catalyzed in 2014 towards Southeast Asia amid the turbulent security dynamics that have been taking place, particularly since 2010, 2009, which I have indicated as China's uh, transition from operationalizing a so-called good neighborhood strategy, right? Which was, again, a veil for its expansionist ambitions, which it had been showing since 1949, the creation of the PRC to begin with. Uh, the initial years were bent on expansionism. Um, but however, the shift towards a more assertive and belligerent form of expansionism took place post-2009. Um, and especially when China submitted its nine-dash line claim to the UN for the first time, um, well, that was in 2009. 2011, we've seen over uh, 10 uh, incursions into Philippine waters in the West Philippine Sea uh, in the first quarter. So the, the situation was quite uh, intense uh, since 2008, 2009. Uh, but I believe that it was India's steadfast commitment since 2014. It's signaling, which matters a lot to Southeast Asian countries, and we can talk about this later on, uh, which served as a positive pillar for Southeast Asian states to rely on. Obviously, in the past few decades, there was this reluctance and wariness about whether India would be able to commit itself significantly in Southeast Asia. Uh, th there were, of course, legitimate concerns and uh, uh, legitimate uh, uh, explanations, particularly from India's perspective, given the highly unstable, uh, unstable relationship with uh, Pakistan, and it continues to do so in South Asia, and of course, a plethora of other traditional and non-traditional issues in the IOR. But then eventually, Post-2014, we see India recognizing the need to do more, to engage more, and to position itself within the power dynamics through multi-alignment powered by strategic autonomy, shedding, of course, the non-aligned position of deviating from power relations. But India has done so in such a way that has been considered quite welcoming in Southeast Asia. So more importantly, the rise of the Indo-Pacific construct um, in 2018. And I say that it is a construct because geographically speaking, you know, the amalgamation of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean as one strategic region to operate in is not new. It was there since the 1800s where various major powers have utilized it in this way. Uh, however, when we look at uh, how um, India was able to leverage the rise of the Indo-Pacific construct, which was pretty much mainstreamed when the U.S. Um, shifted uh, the name of the Pacific Command to the Indo-Pacific Command. However, I argued that the use of the term Indo-Pacific was already mainstreamed nationally, at least in India, in Japan, Indonesia, and even Australia, way before uh, this mainstreaming of uh, the shift in names. However, that also had a, negative, uh, a positive image for Southeast Asian countries as they saw India now as an immediate neighbor. And we continue to look at India now as an immediate neighbor operating in the same strategic region 
compared to how we viewed India a couple decades back as being a distant neighbor from another region. So technically, Southeast Asia and South Asia are still there, but the perception element matters a lot when it comes to uh, the bolstering of strategic relations between both sides. So since then, uh, we have seen a number of important developments uh, being someone who uh, uh, who works on Philippine foreign policy, being an archipelagic state, uh, and among many in Southeast Asia, including Malaysia, Indonesia, and even Vietnam, Southeast uh, Maritime Oriented, at least. Um, we can see that uh, maritime security matters a lot uh, to Southeast Asian states. Um, and in this regard, of course, uh, the continuous push of China not just against the Philippines, but against countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, and even Vietnam recently, as we have seen uh, the, the recent atrocities committed by China and the Chinese Coast Guard against Vietnamese fishermen, uh, leaving them in stretchers afterwards, um, is something of a problem, especially when the region is becoming more and more polarized to the point where it is still difficult to maneuver amidst the overarching U.S.-China power competition. But then again, since 2014, and particularly since 2018, uh, we have seen a lot of important activities that demonstrated the deepening and broadening of India's security engagements in Southeast Asia. So, of course, we have to follow this up with uh, some empirical evidence, you know. So, for instance, um, when we talk about the Philippines, um, well, in general, before I begin, we have to recognize that while India positioned its active policy in 2014, you know, um, it initially sent mixed signals, of course, initially, given that there's this wariness uh, towards the limitations of the Look East policy. Uh, for instance, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Singapore uh, were, in fact, quite enthusiastic in the late 1990s regarding the Look East policy of India. However, because of the internal limitations of India, it was not able to follow through in certain aspects and that led to, of course, um, some, uh, some disappointment in the region. However, as the Modi government continues and continue to operationalize the Actis policy, there was this realization now among many Southeast Asian states, including the Philippines, that India is here to stay, right? And that has led to more openness in working in sensitive areas of cooperation, which India was not necessarily involved in, in the national security calculations of various Southeast Asian countries. So for instance, in the Philippines, um, we have today incorporated openly India into our uh, strategic calculations in uh, the maritime space and to the point where India is today considered as a reliable, trusted and proactive partner in defending the seas. And in fact, since 2016, the number of high level visits, uh, as, you know, uh, you know, improved and increased tremendously, you know, from both sides, particularly in line with security and defense cooperation. Um, looking beyond the Brahmos, uh, we also saw an, uh, an elevation of bilateral and multilateral joint maritime exercises, a number of Coast Guard to Coast Guard, Navy to Navy exercises increased uh, since 2016. And uh, if you look into the multilaterals, in fact, in 2019, it was we had the first ever, and and that was the Philippines, for instance. So beyond the Brahmos, as I mentioned, uh, there were a series of elevation in uh, bilateral and multilateral maritime security exercises um, that include um, Coast Guard to Coast Guard, Navy to Navy, and as I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, the first quad-like exercise with the Philippines, India, Japan, and the United States. So hopefully that this such things would be followed up. Uh, but of course, um, there's a lot of activity. Now, the level of bilateral relationship between India and the Philippines is one, from expanded security activities to institutionalized security activities. So now we have an MOU. Uh, between Coast Guard to Coast Guards. And while we follow through with the MOU on defense cooperation in the early 2000s under President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo during the visit of former President uh, Abdul Kalam, um, we are using that as a foundational sort of umbrella uh, arrangement. But now there are talks ongoing. Uh, in fact, the documents are ongoing in the process of having a new, uh, more reinvigorated umbrella 
uh, MOU on defense acquisition as well for the Philippines to utilize the line of credit from India. So this is significant. Um, and in terms of other countries, for instance, India and Indonesia have stepped up the level of security cooperation. In 2018, there was an unveiling of uh, a new bilateral naval exercise, Samudra Shakti, which was also in line with the elevation of comprehensive strategic partnership. Now, this naval exercise has a warfighting dimension, which is actually quite interesting, given that even in the early 2000s, Indonesia was wary of India's expanding military might and power projection. And another point here that shows the welcome of in, uh, Southeast Asian states like Indonesia was that India for the first time docked its uh, submarine in a port in Indonesia, illustrating the, uh, uh, the operational reach of the Indian Navy uh, within Southeast Asia. And the fact that Indonesia, uh, which is often considered as the de facto uh, leader of ASEAN, uh, welcomed this initiative shows that Indonesia has long gone past its era of wariness towards India's military rise and great power rise and has accepted it with open arms despite certain limitations. So this is, again, another important aspect. Um, if you talk about Vietnam, another very important aspect is that when India and Vietnam signed a logistics pact, this is the first time Vietnam has signed such a pact with any other country, giving India access to its base, for instance. And uh, in fact, it is unprecedented, given the hardened and strict four-nose policy of Vietnam. Um, this shows how Vietnam is opening up uh, to, of course, treating India as a trusted partner, to the point that India's elevation to comprehensive strategic partnership in Vietnam's foreign policy was a lot faster and more intimate than the US, Japan, or even South Korea, right? Or even Australia, which came much later, right? So on top of that, uh, we also have a number of important capacity building efforts, which India has led in the region. So for instance, we have the STEMEX uh, between Singapore and Thailand, which I believe was unveiled sometime in 2019. Um, we also have, for the first time, within this fifth iteration of BINBAX, for instance, between Vietnam, the inclusion of the Air Force in the Army to Army exercises. So we can see the deepening and broadening. If you look at it from an institutional level, we look into the elevation of uh, India-ASEAN relations to comprehensive strategic partnership in 2022, Few months after, followed by an unprecedented first ever India Southeast Asian maritime exercise, um, and in fact, uh, this was this is gaining a lot of prominence. India's security role uh, for two days straight. In fact, I had uh, I was uh, invited by various universities in the Philippines to talk about exactly the 10th anniversary of India's uh, Act East and India's relations with the Philippines. So uh, there's a lot of interest, particularly in uh, Southeast Asia, in my country. And I think that this is a win for India's Act East policy, uh, particularly in that regard. So to my final point, you know, in an increasingly dynamic Southeast Asia, you know, where regional states are often seen to have uh, varied perceptions, diverse interests, um, and different sorts of threat perceptions, a rising India that has a pluralistic dynamic society, understanding the overlaps of national sensitivities is, I think, one of the most important elements for the stability of Southeast Asia. And one point that I'd like to highlight is in the 2024 State of Southeast Asia survey, you know, one chapter that has often been overlooked, and I am not sure why, is the question asked to the Southeast Asian respondents regarding vis-a-vis -vis the US-China power competition, if you were to look for a third country to serve as a buffer, who would it be, right? One, the first choice was Japan. We're talking about states, right? The first was Japan and second is India, right? And this was even a higher ranking compared to countries like South Korea, Japan, or the United Kingdom, uh, or I rather South Korea, Australia, or the United Kingdom. So in this sense, we are seeing that there's something that is being done right. And that is because of how we see India's role in Southeast Asia, one that may not necessarily be directly comparable to China, the US, or Japan in terms of economic engagement 
India still has a lot to do in terms of uh, enhancing its economic capacity, which I do hope um, uh, could be considered. And I think that there's that appetite to do so. Uh, but of course, given the nature of the economies of India and Southeast Asia, um, there are challenges in maximizing it amidst the competition. But still, India has shown that despite certain limitations in that front, its position in Southeast Asia is one that does not seek to sort of directly compete against traditional approaches of other major powers, but one that adds value to it. And I think that that is something that India must continue to work on. Uh, one of the suggestions, I've had the great pleasure of uh, engaging with our uh, Department of Foreign Affairs recently, and the Philippines has, for instance, recently unveiled its new self-reliance defense posture law which talks about improving in the, uh, the Philippines' defense, indigenous defense uh, capabilities. Now, uh, during the first, uh, during the fifth joint uh, consultation in, at the defense uh, minister's level, this was the for first time that it was done at the defense secretary level. So uh, a high-level representative from India was in Manila as well a month ago, and they talked about this very aspect, you know, the convergence of the new law in the Philippines with Adam Nirbhar Bharat, for instance. So I feel that India has a lot to offer in terms of, as Professor Mishra has noted, you know, how India has is becoming, you know, uh, an important player in defense exports. But I don't think that India wants to keep it just as that. And that's something that the Philippines can gain from. Rather than just being transactional based on buying and selling, I think there's a lot of opportunity where India can actually help in building the capacities of Southeast Asian countries, similar to what is happening now between the U.S., South Korea, and the Philippines for invigorating the shipbuilding industry. I've always argued, and I've written a, a column with Professor Fan as well, uh, had the great honor of doing that a few months back, on a third country approach between India, Japan, and Southeast Asia. In fact, the Japanese, uh, the Japan Foundation in the Philippines and the Japanese Embassy have been pushing for some sort of track two uh, between India, Japan, and the Philippines, and India, Japan, Philippines, Vietnam. So there's a lot of appetite for that. But of course, there are limitations. Um, the last point here is that uh, consistency, policy consistency is crucial, um, given, of course, that India's uh, could be considered as a latecomer that is consistent in the in the land of consistency, right? Uh, India has been very consistent in this regard, but I feel that there is more uh, that could be maximized to position itself more favorably amidst the growing uncertainties of regional geopolitics. Thank you so much. I really hope that I didn't take up too much of your time. Uh, thank you. Very much for that. Thank you for that tour de force. You know, we heard a perspective from India, and it's it's great to hear that upbeat perspective about uh, about um, uh, the relationship from from the ASEAN. And you know, you you've raised a number of very interesting issues. I hope we have time to get into them. But you know, centrally, uh, you talked about the uh, Chinese belligerent expansionism and uh, in that context the uh, the US China contestation as well as you mentioned the India China contestation so how does the uh, do the ASEAN countries navigate that you mentioned that uh, they are not uh, very comfortable making choosing between these uh, partners but they can't eternally be fence sitters as well so uh, I think it raises a lot of uh, issues and uh, and particularly your uh, point about uh, each of the ASEAN countries, I think uh, seeing the value that India is adding uh, despite the economic constraints and not matching some of the other countries. But, but thank you for that. I, I hope we'll uh, get into more details. But right now, uh, let's uh, have uh, Pratnashri Basu. Uh, let's have you for your initial comments on on the framing questions or anything you've heard from the last two speakers. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I would echo, uh, I would agree with and echo much of what has already been mentioned by both Professor Mishra and Don. Um, uh, India's uh, Act East, uh, as launched in 2014 as a successor to the earlier Look East policy, 
It did aim to deepen uh, economic, strategic, and cultural ties with Southeast and East Asia. And now marking uh, its 10th year, the policy has evolved in significant ways, uh, especially uh, as uh, India's broader Indo-Pacific strategy has also taken shape. Uh, now, uh, the 2014 announcement, um, I think, marked a new shift in India's strategic outlook, uh, elevating uh, Southeast Asia's uh, stature in India's geo, uh, geo strategic calculus, um, so to speak. And since then, uh, the activist uh, policy has also influenced uh, India's um, uh, engagement uh, with the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and in the past decade, uh, the activist policy has delivered two major achievements. Um, one, uh, it has strengthened uh, the country's diplomatic outreach. And second, it has expanded the geographical scope of our diplomatic engagement. And in this period, uh, India, on the one hand, has uh, deepened uh, its ties uh, with ASEAN, uh, elevating the relationship to a, a comprehensive strategic partnership. And this uh, expansion extends also beyond ASEAN to other East Asian players, as has been mentioned, such as Japan, South Korea, and Australia. And it has enhanced India's role uh, within regional security as well as economic frameworks. Now, India's diplomatic visibility has also risen. Uh, through active engagement uh, in, in across uh, different uh, multilateral uh, forums, uh, the East Asia Forum, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and so on, where the country contributes to uh, shared goals, such as maritime security, trade, and uh, climate resilience even. And I think that a key aspect uh, of India's diplomatic uh, strategy has uh, been the strengthening of uh, policy synergies, uh, particularly with uh, uh, initiatives like the Indo-Pacific uh, Oceans Initiative, um, which has a lot of synergy with uh, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, for instance. And both of these share uh, complementary goals and to an extent also strategic alignment. Uh, India has been able to estab establish a strong presence in regional forums. Um, and um, this institutional engagement has also been crucial for uh, India's uh, role uh, in the region's shifting dynamics, uh, ex as exemplified uh, by, for instance, the first uh, India-ASEAN maritime exercises. Uh, and of course, this brings me to maritime security, which has emerged as a, a key priority area, uh, leading India to play an active role uh, in promoting uh, freedom of navigation, enhancing maritime domain awareness, and also addressing several non-traditional security threats in the region, such as piracy. And this proactive uh, stance has further strengthened India's reputation as a dependable partner in regional security frameworks, reinforced by its involvement in also other forums like the Quad and um, other uh, multilateral and also minilateral initiatives. And uh, in terms of geographic uh, scope, uh, the activist uh, policy has uh, recalibrated uh, India's uh, focus from just Southeast Asia alone to the broader Indo-Pacific, as I mentioned, as a key, as an intense and a key area of um, uh, geopolitical interest for New Delhi. And this shift also aligns with India's vision um, uh, uh, with uh, uh, regional partners uh, and its emphasis on maritime cooperation, especially in the Indian Ocean region and the South China Sea. Uh, and uh, through these expanded efforts, uh, the activist policy has uh, sort of fortified uh, India's position as a regional player that is committed to uh, stability, economic growth, and of course, very importantly, a rules-based Indo-Pacific. And uh, these advancements, all of them mark a very important shift from the earlier look East policy, which although uh, one can argue that it didn't uh, uh, translate much from paper into practice, but which had primarily emphasized uh, economic integration with uh, Southeast Asia's rapidly growing markets. Uh, so the activist policy has adopted a broader, more strategically focused approach uh, that includes security cooperation, regional connectivity, and deeper institutional ties with ASEAN and other uh, East Asian nations. Uh, the move from looking to acting East um, uh, underscores uh, India's commitment to a more proactive and strategic role. 
Uh, now, there have been uh, certain, uh, of course, uh, bottlenecks, uh, challenges that uh, the ACTIS policy has faced and continues to uh, face. Uh, one, for instance, has been ASEAN's um, characteristic ambivalence towards the Indo-Pacific construct um, and, and uh, challenges such as uh, providing a sort of a, a unified approach to the South China Sea disputes, uh, non-traditional security threats and superpower tensions. Uh, also, all of these present very complex complex opportunities. Um, but nonetheless, uh, India and ASEAN do continue to champion a stable, uh, inclusive Indo-Pacific order, which is crucial uh, for the region's uh, peace uh, amidst, of course, uh, further intensifying US-China rivalry. Um, uh, other reasons, such as uh, the, the domestic turmoil in, in, in Bangladesh and Myanmar, um, both crucial uh, for regional connectivity projects, uh, has uh, delayed uh, some of the progress uh, that could have been uh, ha would have happened much at a much faster pace. Um, and although India has secured uh, strategic um, assets such as operating rights at uh, Bangladesh, which is uh, Mongla port, for instance, uh, there are. Um, anti-India sentiments and perceptions, uh, which do from time to time uh, pose risks to these projects. Um, to regain uh, momentum, uh, I think that India could leverage its partnerships, particularly uh, with Japan, a trusted ASEAN partner to enhance connectivity projects and infrastructure. Uh, additionally, uh, strengthening people-to-people uh, -people ties and addressing regional security concerns would uh, bolster uh, India's activist policy and help it solidify its role uh, as, a, as a reliable partner for uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific. And I think that the Indian diaspora in the region, uh, cultural exchanges and educational collaborations remain underutilized uh, tools uh, in India's diplomatic arsenal. Uh, as, as far as regional geopolitics is concerned and, and as it grows uh, and deepens or even gets more complicated, uh, for instance, um, the activist policy can uh, serve to act as a bridge uh, to strengthen political and uh, economic partnerships. So I think that we have seen a lot of movement in the past decade. And I guess uh, in the next decade uh, uh, of the activist policy is going to be much more crucial in, in positioning India to strengthen its uh, leadership role uh, in an increasingly dynamic and changing uh, Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. And let me now uh, go uh, directly to our uh, last uh, presenter uh, before we get into a conversation, and that is Yanita Mina. Uh, so tell us the view from Malaysia. How does it look? Thank you so much, Ambassador. Very good evening. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the uh, organizers. Uh, Abhishek as well, thank you so much. Um, I'm so honored to be part of this very stellar panel. Um, I think the uh, blessing and curse of coming last in a panel like this is that, you know, I don't have a lot to say and I don't have to say a lot, actually. So, uh, you know, please bear with me and I'll try to share my two cents on the matter. Um, so anyway, I, I, we've heard a lot about the Actis policy. And um, I think to me, what's very important is that the Actis policy has shown remarkable flexibility and adaptability. So it has shown to evolve when it needs to. Um, the emergence of the Indo-Pacific order um, demanded that the Actis policy be recalibrated to sort of, sort of drive India's approach to the Indo-Pacific through the EPOI, as we've already heard. Um, at, the ad, at the 10th year mark, um, India's engagement with the region has expanded significantly under the AEP, as we've already heard as well, with a growing focus on the Indo-Pacific as the policy's geostrategic focus. Um, so I think what we have to remember here is that the 2019-2020 MEA report, for example, emphasized that acting east is now central to India's Indo-Pacific outlook. So I think this is very important to sort of, uh, sort of understand. Um, and so to recap, of course, when we talk about the Lukis in the 90s and then it evolved slowly to the Actis policy in 2014, and now sort of positioning the AEP as the cornerstone of the Indo-Pacific strategy, India has shown that the policy as such is malleable and sort of responsive to its policy framework. Um, it's, it's a very malleable policy framework. This, however, does not mean that it has worked consistently in Southeast Asia um, for engagement uh, in, in the region, Malaysia included. Um, so despite the fact that the AEP, I think most recently when Prime Minister Modi went to, uh, I mean, spoke at Laos, he mentioned that the AEP is where ASEAN is at the heart of and, uh, you know, the 
of, of utmost priority. I'm quoting the joint statement of uh, strengthening the CSP. Um, despite the fact that the AEP is said to be the core of India's EPOI, Southeast Asian countries have not been too forthcoming with, uh, you know, on endorsing, uh, working with India in this framework. And to date, only Vietnam, Philippines and Indonesia have endorsed the EPOI bilaterally. On the other hand, if we see, uh, you know, over the past three years, ASEAN and India have worked to sort of align their strategic interests, um, leading the adoption of the joint statement on cooperation um, uh, for regional peace in November 2021. And while the statement, you know, aims to sort of deepen their partnership by exploring synergies between the AOIP and the EPOI. So this is like a buzzword, right? We always, there's always talk about synergies between the AOIP and EPOI, despite the fact that the AOIP itself uh, launched in 2019 seems to be sort of losing, uh, you know, its momentum right about now. Um, it is at most and sort of at best a first step without, you know, any long term sort of tangible commitment. There are also sort of uh, there are also prevalent observations, of course, that India's ambition to assert uh, its leadership in the Indo-Pacific could challenge ASEAN centrality. Of course, the school of thought that uh, I'm not part of, I don't agree with this. I think it, it can it, it's sort of absurd to think that uh, India's growing profile in the region could be any threat to ASEAN centrality. Um, to me, the reasons for uh, the reasons for you know this this lackluster approach uh, of, of Southeast Asia to uh, India's EPOI perhaps stems from Southeast Asia's reluctant or lukewarm recognition of the Indo-Pacific, as Dr. Basu had already mentioned, and and of course because it may be perceived as exclusionary to China, or there is a comfort in that perennial wait and see approach that of course Malaysia is uh, you know sort of aligned with in the past few years. Um, it must be acknowledged, however, that this hesitancy has sort of gradually diminished over the years um, as it becomes clear that the Indo-Pacific is here to stay. And to take the case of Malaysia as a sort of leak li leak least likely case, uh, Malaysia for the longest time did not use requisite Indo-Pacific semantics until very recently when Prime Minister Anwar is now, uh, you know, he, he's more inclined to use Indo-Pacific on in his speeches and statements and etc. So this, this sort of shows that uh, this example sort of clearly demonstrates that in relation to Southeast Asia, the challenge of cooperating within the Indo-Pacific or, or even coalescing around the construct remains a potent challenge, and more so for India with, with partners. So while the EPOI could well be a useful platform for cooperation uh, with Southeast Asia, the jarring fact that it may take time and sort of soft convincing to be on the same page about baselines, optics, and messaging raises concerns that perhaps the current phase or phase or manifestation of the ACTIS policy may not be the best approach for Southeast Asia in particular. Um, the fact, but but the, I think the, the, the key message here is that the fact that the AEP can sort of anchor itself to a strategic concept like, uh, you know, like the Indo-Pacific justifies that moving forward, India's AEP in the next decade should be the core of its approach to, to the global South to sort of better engage ASEAN and Southeast Asia. And of course, India is no stranger to the Global South uh, narrative. I think um, I, I wouldn't say that India is uh, aspiring for leadership. I would say that India is aspiring to be the voice of the Global South. And this has been very palatable to, to Southeast Asia in, in the last two years or so since India actually uh, held chairmanship of the G20. Um, and so it is relatively easier and, of course, more effective for India to engage Southeast Asia within the Global South narrative. And it is less, you know, uh, contentious than coalescing solely around the Indo-Pacific concept since all Southeast Asian countries identify with Global South semantics in one way or another. Um, and India's Global South cooperation pitch is, of course, challenge-based, as we've seen in uh, the G20 statement or even during the Voice of Global South summits. Um, it is sensitive to the sort of general disposition of Global South countries and, most importantly, starts the same baseline that resonates with all Global South countries. So similar to how India's recent structured engagement with Africa has sort of enabled New Delhi to cooperate closely uh, within the region with, with the region through its Global South push, India must also try and consciously recalibrate its ACTIS policy to make Southeast Asia the core of its Global South ambitions. So, and there are early signs of this as well. So uh, during uh, Prime Minister Modi's um, uh, intervention in Laos, uh, he mentioned the 12 point, uh, uh, you know, uh, 12 point proposal for strengthening India-ASEAN cooperation and point five called specifically for collectively raising issues faced by the Global South in multilateral forum. 
So now let me just pivot a bit before I end my remarks to Malaysia's experience of the Act East policy. Um, so for Malaysia, I think very different from what Don mentioned in Philippines, where there's a lot of appetite to talk about the Act East policy. But for Malaysia, uh, a Southeast Asian country with its own long-standing Blue East policy engaging Japan, South Korea, and most recently China, Act East semantics do not typically associate with India. So if you talk about Act East uh, the first thing you're going to talk about is Japan and, you know, the actual East country. So it's very rare for uh, those semantics to, to relate to India. And so this, the, the, there's a mismatch in perceptions between India and Malaysia. And that's why it is very challenging to sort of quantify and appreciate the impact of India's policy uh, on Malaysia after a decade. Um, it perhaps also doesn't help that uh, the Enhanced Strategic Partnership that was signed in 2015, uh, which is, of course, the predecessor of the CSP, which is which was recently signed in um, this year with uh, when Prime Minister Anwar visited India. Um, it, it is the ESP, which is seen as the structural and functional manifestation of the Actis policy in, uh, of India's Actis policy. Um, left much to be desired in terms of uh, focus, cooperation mechanisms, and these did not age well. Um, that is, it did not reflect geopolitical realities, and neither did it match the nature, role, and profile of India and Malaysia after all those years. So um, there are real opportunities to, of course, turn this around uh, with the signing of the CSP uh, this year. Uh, so to me, a strong CSP, a strong document, a strong um, approach uh, to the CSP or any version of it is indicative of a strengthened Act East policy. And this is true, of course, for the rest of Southeast Asia as well, because India have has these arrangements with Vietnam, Indonesia, Brunei, Thailand, and also Singapore, which, uh, of course, signed the CSP this year as well. Um, it is also, of course, telling that uh, Malaysia has been very recently been very forthcoming in deepening cooperation with India within the Global South agenda, as illustrated during uh, PM Anwar's visit. And participation, of course, in um, Indian-led initiatives such as the Big Cat Alliance, and we're also in talks to join the um, International Solar Alliance as well, um, is you know indicative of this. So the Malaysian experience also sort of lends weight to my argument that the AEP will have more impact in Southeast Asia if it is also anchored to India's Global South mobilization efforts. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and that's a great idea to put on the table that, uh, you know, the core of uh, India's approach to the Global South should include the Act East policy. So I think uh, that itself is, is a strong idea. But what we have from all... Uh, four speakers of, uh, is is a very rich uh, kind of uh, set of issues. And uh, what we'll do when we take this forward is perhaps uh, reflect a bit on the future. But, uh, you know, from what all of you have mentioned um, in terms of the evolution of India's policy, uh, perhaps from its articulation in the 1990s, we... The 1990s were perhaps uh, a period of articulating this act, uh, look east policy. 2000s was a period of engagement. I was personally a beneficiary of that because I was in uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee's office and I got to see all of uh, uh, the ASEAN countries. We traveled to Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia. And uh, there was a great deal of engagement at that time. And then uh, we've had a decade, uh, perhaps, as all of you pointed out, of outcomes, uh, a large number of outcomes in this period uh, and a large number of initiatives. But uh, you've all pointed out to some of the infirmities of this policy. So the question I would now pose to each one, and we'll go in the same order, is what are the three to five things you would uh, initiatives you would like to see in the next decade uh, when India moves ahead uh, with this policy in the next phase of uh, Act, the Act India policy, uh, Act East policy? Uh, what is it that you'd like to see? We'll uh, that will take us to fifteen to twenty minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions and wrap up in about uh, 40 minutes from now. So let me uh, start with you, um, uh, Professor Mishra. Uh, that and the question that we left unanswered earlier, which is the uh, security-centric uh, kind of uh, issues that uh, we were addressing, what else would you like India to do uh, in, in the sense of 
uh, being part of the ASEAN security networks and frameworks? And what would you like uh, India to do more uh, in terms of its activities policy? Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I think uh, uh, moving forward, um, there are a number of things that India could do. And I'll start with uh, the point that you raised, security-centric institutions and where India could fit more uh, uh, more, more naturally is create within ASEAN, you don't have to go formal on this, but informally within ASEAN, create a network of, um, a, or a coalition, if you will, of willing countries, willing partners. And India and Japan uh, are already working on that. So this three country partnership has actually started already. Uh, uh, the first example of, or first case of that was uh, Sri Lanka, where India and Japan worked to, together in um, building the Colombo uh, port, which when it was uh, taken away from China. In Southeast Asian region, this is already happening. And hopefully in times to come in the Southwest Pacific region, particularly in Fiji, where you have a good uh, a number of Indian diaspora presence. Uh, and there, our partner could be Australia. So India, Australia working in, um, in the Southwest Pacific region. So three country partnership. I think there is also, and this was also one of the questions that uh, Abhishek had sent, uh, whether Act East policy is harmonized with India's Indo-Pacific vision. And there I want to put this uh, uh, on record that you know we should not uh, confuse between what the objectives of Act East are, what Quad is, and what Indo-Pacific vision is. Your initiative, Act East policy, Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, Quadrilateral Alliance, or Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, Sagar, and Project Mossum, all of these are just tools to meet or to, to realize your Indo-Pacific vision. And we've got to be very clear on that. These Act East and Quad are tools. These are mechanisms that will help you achieve your goals. And therefore, there is a need to more systematically harmonize Act East policy objectives with Indo-Pacific vision. And uh, so to me, all these initiatives that we have taken over the past 30 years, let's say from, from Lukistan, not just Act East, uh, which includes BIMSTEC and Mekong Ganga, uh, to me, it looks like you know these islands of initiatives. These are patches of uh, uh, policy uh, initiatives that will help you achieve some of your goals, but it still does not meet the objectives that a rising power India should have in, in engaging the Indo-Pacific region. And I pose a, a couple of questions. What is India's policy on North Korea, for example? How do we deal with Taiwan? How do we deal with the infrastructure development initiatives that China has taken? Shake tells us that- Recording in progress. Okay, there All is right. some- uh, What are the- They're back. Okay. What are the uh, uh, in, uh, responses to China's infrastructure building in the Indo-Pacific, uh, even on the South China Sea question? So one may argue that, uh, I mean, if you, if you talk to somebody who is more conservative representing the government would say, well, we don't have to uh, make a decision on these. Maybe just put them in a, you know, in a, on a coal burner and not really talk about this at this stage. But that still begs the question as to how are we looking at the wider Indo-Pacific region. You cannot have, these are major potential flashpoints and you cannot not have a policy on this. I mean, even a policy that we are non-aligned, we don't want to interfere is good enough, but have a policy. So is there a document that tells us, okay, these are X, Y, Z objectives of, of our Indo-Pacific policy and this is how we're going to achieve it. You have some tools at your disposal, which are very good, but there is still a uh, need to synchronize this. Now, moving forward, what are the new areas of cooperation? I think uh, defense cooperation is certainly a very good uh, opportunity. Uh, and just to uh, uh, respond to Don's uh, point, that India is, not, India is not transactional on defense cooperation, and India can never be transactional on that because most, uh, all the cases actually, with Philippines, with Vietnam, are defense exports is based on providing a line of credit, which in itself is, uh, tells you that uh, there is no profit-making motive there. 
right? So uh, defense cooperation is uh, certainly uh, one of the uh, ways forward. Greater role in building maritime infrastructure. And there you can just look for uh, countries which are interested, which are keen to look for uh, a provider uh, of options on the military and maritime security front. Uh, so infrastructure building is certainly uh, something that India should look at. Uh, tourism, particularly the inbound flow of tourists now, because India's, I think, past two, three years, India has really shown, the Indian, uh, Indian people have shown <laughs> how much they can flood a country as tourists. So this, these are cases in Thailand, Malaysia, and, and, uh, and Vietnam recently. Singapore has always been a case. So that will help us boost people-to-people uh, -people linkages and bring some more uh, uh, opportunities on the uh, trade and tourism and hospitality sector. Supply chain uh, uh, resilience and creating supply chain resilience, having these countries which are already part of either the Japanese or the Chinese or the American supply chain uh, mechanisms. Uh, building ties with them and working on supply chain resilience, creating um, mini supply chain uh, mechanisms, I would say, is something that we could work on. Semiconductor sectors, already, uh, India has already started working on that with Singapore, with Malaysia, with Taiwan, and that perhaps is the way forward. Uh, and I think uh, last but not the least is new and emerging technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, use of robotics and swarms in South China Sea, maybe in the Indian Ocean as well. And countries like China are already using that. So how do you uh, build capacities collectively on these uh, new and emerging technologies on artificial intelligence, use of artificial intelligence in scientific uh, advances uh, of military nature and in warfare is something that India has to work with. Uh, uh, I think more uh, practical would be to start working with the US, Japan, and Australia, and then later on moving to other countries. So these are, uh, to my mind, the, uh, the potential areas for cooperation. Very much. Let me take it to you, Don. Um, uh, from uh, from what I'm hearing, um, uh, what uh, Professor Mishra has summarized it to be: defense, maritime infrastructure, tourism, people to people, uh, supply chain resilience, uh, and in technology, semiconductors and new tech, emerging tech, um, and also addressing the elephants in the room, which is North Korea which is addressing Chinese belligerence, the China-US contestation, the China-India contestation. So how do you, uh, would you like to add to this laundry list uh, uh, in terms of anything more, or uh, how would you like to deal with these challenges in the next decade? Thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, yes, I, I believe Professor Mishra has uh, highlighted a number of uh, important points. Uh, so there would obviously be overlaps uh, with uh, with some suggestions. But I think if I were to add more to this um, uh, from a Southeast Asian perspective again, uh, many in the region, in fact, there's a growing demand in countries such as the Philippines and Indonesia, particularly, uh, to recognize themselves not just as Southeast Asian countries, but Indo-Pacific Indo countries as well, meaning that they have equal and significant interests, not just within the immediate neighborhood, but spanning to their utmost east and their utmost west. And uh, President Ferdinand Marcus Jr., for instance, uh, wonderfully highlighted this in uh, the Shangri-La Dialogue. And when we look into the Philippines position again, um, if I may sort of narrow it down just to add more value to the conversation. Um, we have to look into uh, the Philippines' desire to have a level of engagement in the Indian Ocean region. Why is that? And, and I've argued on several occasions that the Philippines must do more to the West. Um, one is that we have the largest uh, seafarers, the largest number of seafarers. Uh, Indonesia is also in the top three but the Philippines takes the cake in this regard. Uh, and most of our seafarers traverse through the Indian Ocean. And uh, if, if we recall, you know, the number of ships that the Indian Navy had pro proactively secured and rescued, uh, there were a huge number of Filipino sailors in each of these ships. So the Philippines does not have any anchor in the Indian Ocean. It is relatively 
um, unknowing in terms of having robust engagements in the Indian Ocean. Um, there have been countries like Saudi and the UAE and the Persian Gulf uh, that are seeking to work with the Philippines in terms of defense, uh, but it still really hasn't left the table in terms of capacity building and serving as an anchor in the region. So. Uh, in this regard, the second point is a majority of our Filipino overseas workers are situated within the Indian Ocean region, if you include uh, West Asia into this dynamics as well. Um, and on top of that, of course, would be the realization for uh, Filipinos to also engage in uh, the shared maritime security challenges that the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific also faces. So in this regard, one aspect I see is uh, for the Philippines to integrate itself within uh, the existing frameworks of India's uh, security arrangements with Southeast Asian states towards the Indian Ocean. I mean, Milan, the Philippines has been participated in Milan as well. Um, and uh, that is, in fact, a very important. But I think that now under the current administration, there's more push uh, in needing to engage to its West as well. And I believe that India could be that anchor. Um, second point is uh, regarding uh, my comment on transactionalism. Uh, yes, I, I agree with Professor Mishra regarding that the idea is not transactional, but the idea of being transactional practically means the buying and selling aspect. So for instance, the Philippines has been pushing Japan uh, not to go beyond the buyer-seller framework, despite Japan providing us uh, a lot of important technology, South Korea providing us a lot of important technology, um, or rather defense equipment. Uh, but there is still wariness towards tech transfer and joint production. And I think that that level of capacity building to boost the resilience of key Southeast Asian countries would be crucial. And I think that India uh, has that position to work with uh, from the basic level and up to the sophisticated level. Um, you know, uh, there, there are areas that could be explored as well. And this leads to my third point uh, coming from personal experience. And I think that India has had a rich experience in working with loose minilateral arrangements in other parts of the world. Uh, we talk about the France, India, Indonesia, Asia, France, India, Australia. Uh, we talk about Australia, Japan, India. Um, I think that there must be some sort of mechanism uh, to include India and for India to take part um, in such minilaterals in Southeast Asia. So, you know, there, there have been uh, some, uh, some controversy regarding the squad, you know, for, for, for all the wrong reasons, for instance. Uh, there were some commentaries saying that the squad is here, you know, India out, etc. And, you know, that is absolutely not true. I think the value that India brings into the security of the Indo-Pacific uh, is significant and undeniable. You know, in fact, among all the Quad countries, it is India that has had the direct physical experience of pushing back China and its belligerents along the LOs, LAC um, and has that best practice. And in fact, it was uh, a senator in the Philippines, the sister of uh, President Marcos Jr., Senator Aimee Marcos, that said that we must learn from what India has been doing uh, to achieve some sort of uh, patrolling arrangement with China and to sort of uh, emphasize on securing its borders against an expansionist power. So again, there is uh, that appetite to look at best practices from India. And I think that given the, given the fluctuations in Southeast Asian foreign policy, particularly the Philippines, I think it's crucial for India to institutionalize existing partnerships to ensure continuity at least from our end. So if I were to give an example, uh, the Philippines foreign policy since 1946 has been a pendulum going left and right uh, So it, it, uh, to the extreme point. So ensuring political continuity is crucial and you can only achieve that through institutionalizing partnerships. And I believe that we're heading that way now. And uh, to have a sort of unified collective approach to Southeast Asia, I think would not be uh, productive for India, given the very nature uh, of Southeast Asia. And I think Yanita has pointed that out wonderfully in stating that, uh, you know, you, and this is where the West gets uh, the region wrong, is trying to have an overarching uh, umbrella approach to the region. 
and uh, that's that's not really going to work. Uh, there is no I, there is no push uh, towards uh, you know there can't be a push towards any particular value driven any particular collective approach given the various security perceptions. But then there's an opportunity for India to work in each and every way. So for instance, the pulling out of RCEP is that actually considered quite negatively in Southeast Asia, but rather the Western narrative saying that India does not seek to integrate itself economically within Southeast Asia. But, you know, there are several other ways in which India would be able to offset uh, these institutional challenges, and that is by involving itself in loose arrangements, which are very much in the interests of Southeast Asia. And the last point I'd like to make is that there is that recognition in Southeast Asia that India's role is beneficial. In fact, it is because of India's presence in the Quad that makes the Quad seem less controversial to Southeast Asia compared to AUKUS. That is because of India's steadfast consistency in strategic autonomy and multi-alignment, which many in Southeast Asia converge with. So I believe that it's all about continuing the conversation. The Indochina region, Cambodia and Laos, uh, I've, I've attended several track 1.5s as well, and you have government officials stating that we don't want to be a basal state of China, but it's just that we have limited options for now. And I think that that is something that India could get involved in, either commercially or uh, in terms of security. So I think that there are a lot of potential here. Um, but of course, the challenge is maintaining consistency amidst the structural changes and uncertainty and the individual policy calculations of Southeast Asia. So I think that's the challenge that uh, India would have to navigate, but it, it's not an impossible task. So um, consistency, despite the uncertainty and more minilaterals, that's your uh, recommendation. On on the China factor, you know, on uh, you mentioned the um, LAC pushback and what India is attempting. Just to uh, make it clear, um, from my point of view, is. Uh, is a tactical adjustment at the border. It's no, not a strategic reset. So the China challenge will be upon us uh, for the next several decades, uh, as it will be for the ASEAN region as well. So let me take this uh, to uh, Pratnashri. Uh, anything to add to what you've heard from uh, on, on, on a roadmap for the next decade? Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think that going forward, uh, India's engagement uh, under the at least uh, rubric is perhaps going to follow three uh, different formats. Uh, the first being uh, more and more functional cooperation. We have seen some um, uh, a bit of this in uh, the Quad Partnership, which has worked on uh, vaccines, uh, on health, and so on. So functional cooperation under uh, minilaterals or even bilaterally on uh, areas such as supply chain resilience, public health, and so on could be one way to go. Uh, the second uh, would perhaps be... Um, a greater number of um, or a greater uh, uh, you know combinations of uh, triangular cooperation so india and japan partnering to work in another third country for uh, developmental purposes uh, that could be another uh, format uh, that uh, going forward would be useful uh, and in that in the, under this uh, format uh, infrastructural connectivity would i think uh, comprise a very uh, crucial uh, component and thirdly i think that india would of course want to leverage its own strengths as it uh, sort of enhances its uh, relationships bilaterally and also uh, in, uh, multilaterally uh, within the Indo-Pacific region uh, th uh, through, for instance, India's experience in digitalization and uh, enhancing the digital economy uh, is going to be an important part. So I think these three formats could be uh, ways that India uh, furthers its um, activist policy in in the decade uh, in the next decade or just going forward in the years ahead and I, but I think that all of these um, would be underscored very strongly by India's intent to uh, to to uh, engage in construct engage constructively uh, with with all the countries across the region because um, that aligns with India's uh, goal of uh, being a reliable, uh, dependable partner uh, uh, for countries in the region. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, Yanita, uh, anything to add uh, to what you've heard? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. So I'm going to give you two minutes to add anything you'd like to. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I'll make it very quick. Um, so I think that <clears throat> moving forward, I think India through its activist policy uh, itself, I think it needs to sort of emphasize or lead interregionalism. I think that's very important. So when we talk about, uh, for example, um, ASEAN BIMSTEC relations, for example, I think it really fits into the entire sort of global south narrative, global south agenda. I think it feeds, uh, feeds into it very well. I think India's uh, uh, position in IORA, for example, with, you know, in terms of uh, because uh, India was the one who led the Indo-Pacific outlook for IORA as well. So I think India's um, role in these mechanisms, I think it can be really bolstered uh, through, you know, pushing it through its activities policy. Um, I think just very quickly, one more thing that I'd like to add is, um, so last week I attended the ASEAN India Network of Think Tanks uh, roundtable. And one thing that I really found very interesting was that there is a sort of, um, it's, I, I think there's a clear mismatch between how India views itself how ASEAN views India and how India wants to be viewed by ASEAN. I think that's there's, there's, there's a very clear mismatch between that. So I think moving forward, perception building is very important for India in Southeast Asia. I think trying to understand that uh, India is a rising power, a rising power to stay. Uh, I think uh, Southeast Asia needs to internalize that better because that sort of uh, creates a base, the basis for deeper and functional ties. I think Don mentioned the um, um, ISIS state of uh, uh, Southeast Asia survey, and he mentioned that uh, you know India ranked very highly in the in terms of being a balancer to the region. But one thing that we have to understand is that India also ranked ninth in terms of strategic relevance to ASEAN. So I think there's a very clear mismatch on 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 what India's role is in the region. So I think. You know, to be able to understand this, I think the ACTIS policy needs to be strengthened and needs to be more palatable to the region. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's been a very rich set of issues. So let me quickly open it up uh, to the audience here for any questions. Uh, quick, sharp, pointed questions, please. Yes, please. Gentlemen in the middle. My question is with the panelists, what is your views on economic and trade pillar of ACTIS policy specifically? With respect to RCEP, has the trade aspect been the weakest pillar of ACTIS policy? Can we really think of meaningful economic engagement within the region out of this? The important areas which we can engage on are the new emerging technologies, trade related issues, particularly those related to green economy and digital economy. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a bunch of questions and then take it to, uh, I'll go back. Yes, please. Thank you for uh, taking my question. My question uh, is with regards to was what uh, Ms. Yanita said, that uh, there is uh, a lack of understanding when it comes to perception of India in Southeast Asia. Could she please elaborate more on that? Okay. Yes, please. Free trade agreement review. Uh, I think uh, what is really the uh, scenario at this point, and uh, you know what India, what is India going to look for in a review of the FTA with ASEAN? Uh, yes, please, on the left. Yeah. Uh, basically, lots of discussion done on uh, commerce, connectivity, and capacity building. Are we really lack uh, instead in in field of culture? We are, I think, we are lacking somewhere in as a culture already. Culture. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello. Yeah, my name is uh, Harsh Thakur from Hindu College. Uh, two categorical questions. Uh, firstly. In Myanmar, we, uh, India is treating the junta as a reality. And should India engage with the other groups in Myanmar so that there can be a comprehensive work on those projects which are actually stuck because of the conflict there? Uh, second question is, uh, sir spoke about uh, having policies on things. But at times, isn't it better to have ambiguities where perhaps defining policies right now may have uh, repercussions in the future? OK. so. Five questions. I'm going to take it uh, to our panelists and uh, starting with you, Professor Mishra. Please take a uh, shot at uh, all or any of these questions. Uh, trade being the weakest link, uh, yes, it has been the weakest link. And uh, I would say the problem doesn't solely lie with India. And take, for instance, the India ASEAN FTA. When we signed the FTA, we signed it for diplomatic reasons. We wanted ASEAN countries to be our friend. We, we had a timeline and sir uh, was directly involved there, I believe. Uh, we had the strategic partnership agreement uh, uh, back then, um, knocking at our doors. And so we signed the agreement, thinking that this is a 
a gentleman or gentlewoman's agreement and things will sort out, sort themselves out, and it will be a, a, a transparent, fair trade. What has happened is the agreement signed in 2009, 15 years down the line, we are realizing that we are actually losing a lot of money. The negative, uh, and in Indian media, we keep saying, oh, you know, our uh, trade balance is so negative with China and they are dumping their goods. What we don't see is how ASEAN India trade has gone. The, the balance of trade is actually negative. And it is not the case with other countries. I mean, how ASEAN has signed FTA agreements with China, with, with Japan, with other countries, it's different, right? So that is one problem. Uh, so in that sense, maybe uh, retrospectively thinking we should have uh, had a better agreement. First, uh, signing both trading goods and services together, but that was not the case. Things were not in our hands. So I totally understand where India is, is, coming, is coming from on that issue. And Southeast Asian countries took a lot of time, Indonesia, Philippines at that time, and they have uh, individual country ratification. Now, RCEP, India's concerns are genuine, but there is no way you can stop the uh, uh, Chinese commodities coming from other RCEP countries. How do you deal with that? So uh, either you stay out or you just deal with the situation as it is. I think that is a more practical way. Um, so progress on FTA review is primarily because the government is, at the moment, is very uh, firm on this idea that this agreement needs a review and a fair review. And there has to be, if not a, a really a 100% a favorable solution, at least find a middle ground. You cannot just continue this FTA because you want to be friends with uh, countries. And this also has China and RCEP linkages, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the cultural uh, component, I think India is doing a lot uh, on that front. And my own personal, very personal opinion is that maybe some of that money should be shifted to strategic and military component. We are really doing too much. I mean, I'm sorry for putting it like this. Uh, but maybe we are doing too much of yoga and too much of Ayurveda and, and Ayush. Let us do some a little bit more on aircraft carriers and submarines and, and guns and grenades because our partners need it. Uh, which brings me to my final point, uh, the Myanmar question. Uh, those who know things uh, like behind the, the curtains know that India is engaging other, uh, other stakeholders as well. It is not just the military junta. It's just that we are no longer obsessed with NUG or Aung San Suu Kyi. We are engaging uh, uh, the rebel groups, uh, not all of them, but those who are of interest and concern. And, and our uh, policymakers and leaders have had uh, meetings uh, with them. We are engaging them, but this is a very, very cautious approach, I would say, keeping your security interest in mind. And there are very strong reasons to, to say that uh, to believe that maybe this is a practical approach, not very good looking in terms of its appearances at the global forum, but uh, more practical, more grounded. Thank you. I think you've taken care of all the questions. Just one remaining, which was directly addressed to Yanitha. Uh, would you like to just uh, quickly in the next one minute answer that? Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so when I say perception building is, is a challenge for India in Southeast Asia, I mean that uh, the perception of India still is uh, the India of the 1990s, for example, in, in Malaysia, particularly if I want to talk about Southeast Asia, I'm going to come from a Malaysian perspective. And that is true for, for, for many reasons. Um, let me just take a very good example. Um, so when India chaired the G20, so that was a phenomenal success. I mean, as a, you know, as a Southeast Asian from here, when I look at it, it was a phenomenal success. But the fact is that um, the ASEAN Secretariat was, of course, invited to uh, to to attend that. Uh, Indonesia attended, and that's it. There was there was no other Southeast Asian representation uh, to the G20 summit. So there was no visibility in that sense on what India actually did. Of course, there was the uh, Voice of Global South Summit and all that. But the reality is that uh, the the fact that India's uh, you know profile as a rising power is still very lost to Southeast Asia because the the the, the narratives that the the relationship is seen through older narratives, safer conceptions. Because when they are you know when we stick to older narratives, we don't have to deal with the reality that our that we need to recalibrate our relationship. You know how we look at our relationship with India. 
uh, whether we see it as a security provider, a first responder, we need to change that. And so um, I think that is the, the I think the um, the acknowledgement is missing in ASEAN because if if we do, then we have to completely change our approach to India as well. So it's it's taking it's it's a very long process. Um, but I also feel that India can play a role in the sense that to make um, you know discussions in track two uh, in you know track one point five track two discussion, you can make it more about uh, you know India's role in the region, not only about tangible cooperation like uh, for example green energy MSMEs. Those are important as well. But strategic discussions, India's uh, role in the region, what does India hope to achieve through its relations with Southeast Asia? I think these discussions are missing. Frank discussions about this are missing. So when these discussion are, uh, discussions are missing in Southeast Asia, then you know the, the entire discourse is missing. And so I think India needs to uh, um, make sure it needs to shape discussions around you know in these roundtables in, for example, Raisina dialogue, Delhi dialogue, you know all these roundtables. They need to have a specific you know sessions on India's geopolitical uh, sort of role. I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, so great discussions uh, held and more discussions required. Uh, that is what you're suggesting. Um, so a 30 second summary of this very rich discussion with four panelists uh, for 90 minutes is that it's been a great decade of a very successful uh, Act East policy, but course corrections required and a lot more to do. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you panelists for such a rich discussion. Thank you.